I'm going to talk about Slocum gliders in the Great Lakes um, and a little bit about this real-time uh, ecosystem observation network called Rayon. Um, just to start, because I think a lot of ocean people don't often respect the Great Lakes and the importance of it, uh, it is 21% of the, of the world's surface fresh water and 84% of what we have in North America. And most of the climate models suggest that the Great Lakes are going to remain full for a long time and, in fact, are probably over full. If you took the coastline of the Great Lakes, it is longer than the east and west coast of the United States, so it's big. Um, it's also important with regards to population GDP. So if you took the Great Lake Basin of and included Canada and the United States, it'd be the fourth largest economy in the world. Um, yet it's regional, according to Tensor. Anyways, uh, so I just want to point out how important the Great Lakes is. Um, and what is Rayon? So Rayon was actually modeled off the idea of the Ocean Tracking Network, OTM, because I, I wasn't involved in the original CFI, but I was involved in NSERC and MSI applications and stuff like that. And my other partner in crime that you all know is Steve Cook. So Steve was really important in getting Rayon going. And so it was a CFI IF $17.4 million grant that got funded in 2017. And then just recently, like um, OTN, we were asked to uh, combine with the Global Water Futures uh, Program at the University of Saskatchewan, and we created the Global Water Futures Observatory, and we were successfully funded on CFI MSI for just over 40 million. So Rayon is going to continue as part of a larger group uh, to 2029. So we're quite excited about that. So that's good news. Um, so what I'm gonna talk uh, just Quickly, Rayon is, we loan out equipment like Ocean Tracking Network does, and we have lots of acoustic telemetry, but we have all kinds of other instrumentation, uh, mainly related to limnological uh, characteristics and, and measuring those kinds of things. So we sort of have, we use the framework and ideas of OTN to do that. So if you're looking for instrumentation and it's related to fresh water, please come and visit Rayon. So what I'm going to quickly talk is this is about Slocum gliders. We bought four Slocum gliders. Um, we got them sort of mid late 2019, <laughs> and then COVID hit. But we did manage to do missions in, in 2020 and 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 we 21 and 22 this year. You can see the uh, uh, instrumentation that we got for it. Um, in particular, we have these uh, VR2C minis. You can see them are little horns on the end of the gliders. All of our gliders carry those. We also have a hydroacoustic bay, and we have a VR4 offload a modem, which we have been working uh, with OTM. We partnered up to uh, get the to get that built and to get the computers and, and to be able to link it into the Slocum glider. And I was talking to Jude about it, and I need to talk to Adam because we, we need to do some of that early in the spring. There are five other uh, Slocum gliders in the Great Lakes, and they've been there since about 2010, a couple of them. And it's a very cohesive group. So we meet regularly and talk regularly and plan our missions together. In fact, two of the Slocum gliders that Rayon bought have never been on Canadian soil. We've been leaving them at the University of Michigan and running them out of there. So it's a very... The Great Lakes is a very collaborative environment. Just some quick things that we've done. Uh, we've been actually in Lake Michigan as well, but uh, with regards to the Canadian Great Lakes, we've been in Lake Superior. Uh, we worked with other AUVs to do missions and compare results uh, to, port, to support CSMI. So CSMI is a program where every year they move around to the five Great Lakes and do extensive work there. Um, and so whenever there's a CMSI year, and so 2022 is Lake Superior, they to collect more data. In Lake Erie, we've used it to do Western Basin limnology and harmful algal blooms. So Lake Erie is the poster child of harmful algal blooms. And you can see the picture on the right. We flew the glider in water as, as shallow as seven meters. Um, and it does hit bottom occasionally. We also did something really cool is um, we went into the central basin um, where we get all that hypoxia and they do yellow perch surveys and they want to do the yellow perch surveys as soon as the hypoxia disappears. And so what we did is we went out, went along their survey transects, and as soon as the lake turned over, they went out and did their surveys, which was really cool. We've done stuff in Lake Ontario and Lake Huron. I'm going to quickly talk about the Lake Huron stuff. And then this summer, we went into Algonquin Park and uh, flew the glider in one of the lakes there um, with some success and some, some not success. But we're going to continue to try to do that into the future as well. So I'll quickly talk about uh, some of the work in Lake Huron. The first was doing range testing with, with the Slocum glider. So you can see on the picture to the left, this is up here on the mid of Michigan and Lake Huron near Saginaw Bay. And the second picture in the middle, there's the blue dots are uh, VR2s. 
180s and 69s, and the red and yellow were where we put our, our range test tags. Um, we do have 180 data, but we haven't got to it yet. And then those green tracks are where we flew the glider. And then the final picture is where we actually detected the yellow or red tag as it moved around in the system. For those of you who have worked in large freshwater systems, we often get much longer ranges on our acoustic telemetry tags than you all do in the marine environment. And then um, we looked at the um, range of the 69 kilohertz. So the little red on the top line is when the tag pinged and the, and the black on the bottom is when we detected it with the glider. We had two tags that uh, cycle between low and high power. And these are the different uh, detection efficiency uh, curves on different days. So each of the different colors are different days. Um, and you can see we had a lot of variability between different days and between the different tags. Um, and we got somewhere around a 50% detection rate less than 300 meters. Uh, but we really only just getting into the data now. And so there's things to consider. Um, we also carried a V16 tag around with us on the glider. So we need to look at the receiver data to compare it to. And there's a couple of things we need to do. So when the glider dies, it's a term, a, a, a altimeter pings as it's getting to the bottom. So we need to think about that with regards to maybe interference. We also have to consider whether the glider, because our receivers are pointing out to the front of it like a bowl, is either facing or going away from the tag or going up or down. And we also had some pretty variable weather um, that week and that may be affecting the curves that we're seeing. We also want to analyze our 180 kilohertz data. So this is really important to us because we have done a bunch of surveys where we were specifically looking for tagged fish. I'm going to give you one example of this really quickly. This is a project that was funded by the USGS to look at the movement habitat use of Cisco uh, in the northern part of Lake Huron. Uh, historically, Cisco's were very, very abundant, and they're very, very abundant in smaller lakes and are really important prey. They have uh, crashed in many of the lakes, including Lake Huron, as early as the 1900s. Um, part of that was um, sea lamprey. And we've been trying to uh, recover these populations. They're an important prey, but it hasn't really gone that well. And so there's all kinds of, I don't know if you realize that we dump about 12 or 13 million little fish into the Great Lakes every year. Um, used to be as high as 50 million. And so one of the things they're doing is culturing Cisco to release them to try to bring them back into the system. And there is a small population in northern Lake Michigan or Lake Huron. So the thought was that might be a good uh, group to work on. And so uh, what we did was we went out and uh, tagged adult Cisco's and then released them uh, in November. And where it was released is at top of Lake Huron there. So you can see the little blue and, and green dots there. That's where the array was. We used these V9 TP tags and we tagged 400 fish. Actually, we're not quite to 400, and of course, uh, COVID slowed us down a little bit. Um, but getting right into the data, so those blue dots are where the array is, um, and then the green lines are where we flew the glider and look for the fish. And anywhere you see the, the little fish of the Cisco, we detect the Cisco swimming around. So we detected the Cisco away from the ray and in deeper water. And then also, which is kind of cool, we detected some lake trout that were tagged in 2010 with a tag that was only supposed to last five years. Um, and they didn't have kill dates back then. And yet they're still pinging and we're still detecting them. And we're very sure they're, they're alive and moving around. So we have been able to find tag fish in the Great Lakes. And we've done this also in uh, Lake Ontario, um, including with the 180 system where we, uh, Lydia's project with the bloater, we've been able to detect them and we're looking at that data now. So we found uh, Cisco outside the array in deeper water. We found these lake trout that were tagged more than 10 years ago, and they're still swimming around. Um, future work will be doing longer missions next year, uh, going into deeper water to try to find where the Cisco are going in a more uh, controlled mission now that we have a little bit more information moving forward. So real quick, I have to acknowledge because I don't know how to do anything. So Russ and Hayden and, and Cassandra and Todd and, and Kaylin were the, the glider people who looked at the data and, and ran this. Um, Kaylin in particular was our, our, our glider person until the end of June, and then she had another opportunity and moved out west, which slowed us down. Moving forward, there's a lot of interest in using gliders to get limnological data, but also looking for fish tags and doing some of the hydroacoustics, and that's kind of where we're going in the Great Lakes. Again, we, we work together, so all nine gliders are there and we try to share off on missions and, and, and share resources. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Aaron. And just a reminder, we'll save questions uh, to the end. Um, and next up, we've got Dr. Kimberly Davies, Associate Professor with the, New Brun with the University of New Brunswick. Uh, Kim is in this, uh, yeah, she received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Victoria and a PhD in Oceanography from Dalhousie University. She began working on North Atlantic, Atlantic right whales in 2007 with the goal of improving our understanding of the environmental and biological processes affecting their habitat use in Canadian waters. In 2014, she co-created the Whales Habitat and Listening Experiment, an eight-year collaborative research program co-funded by government, NGOs, and industry that seeks to improve knowledge of baleen whale habitat relationships and adaptive conservation management of right whales through acoust real-time acoustic monitoring. She's received several awards for her work in applied and fundamental research, including the Librero Postdoctoral Fellowship in Conservational Research in 2015, followed up by, uh, in 2017 by the CNC SCORE Early Career Scientist Award. Over to you, Kim. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, before I start, I just, when I was uh, watching Adam uh, uh, share with you uh, everything that uh, they have done with the glider program over the last 10 years, it brought back for me a memory that I have of Adam um, back in 2011 when he first got his first uh, glider. I remember him with this this uh, this instrument in front of him with a mix of awe and fear on his plate on his face he had to go and put this in into the ocean and so to see uh, how far uh, this program has come uh, in the last uh, 11 or 12 years has been amazing and it's it's largely due to to Adam's commitment uh, to that program so I'm very happy that he remains committed to it um, so hi, my name is Kim. Thank you so much, uh, Adam, for asking me to, to speak today. I'm going to talk about uh, glider applications um, in oceanography, ecology, and uh, conservation. My lab doesn't do telemetry, so there's no telemetry in this talk, so I'm really glad that Aaron uh, started off uh, uh, telling you about uh, uh, glider applications to, uh, to telemetry. I'm going to talk about some other things, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors who uh, largely uh, did the work that's that's going to be uh, presented uh, in this <clears throat> in this presentation today. Uh, it, this is a collaboration between my lab and uh, two other labs at, at Dalhousie University, and many of my uh, HQP are listed here in the co-author list. So I'm not going to present a lot of detail uh, today. My goal is to highlight for you uh, a number of uh, re different research projects that uh, our lab is uh, working on right now, focusing uh, on some of the newer projects. Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about new ways that we can uh, use gliders to answer important uh, questions in, in oceanography. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, research highlights uh, in, in a few different areas that are listed here. Uh, in our lab, we study zooplankton hotspots on continental shelves. Uh, we study fundamental biological and physical oceanography, as well as predator-prey dynamics in these hotspots. We do some work on underwater acoustics and optics. We study both uh, the, the, the ocean uh, properties, the acoustic and optic ocean properties, as well as how we can use acoustic and optical remote sensors to, uh, to detect biology in the ocean. And we also uh, supply uh, near real time information to improve uh, management response times. And, and that's largely uh, related to my North work on endangered North Atlantic right whales. So that's just a summary of what you're going to see, and I ask each of my uh, HQP to provide one slide on their uh, on their project. So uh, I hope that that this is going to be a, a good overview of of what we do. So that uh, picture that you see on the right hand side there is a Slocum glider uh, with a prototype uh, shadow graph camera. Uh, mounted on the front of it that I, I borrowed from my uh, colleague at NOAA. His name is Christian Rees, and he's a fisheries oceanographer. And he, I was very excited when, when he uh, developed this prototype. 
because uh, the shadow graph camera is something I've been hoping for for gliders for a long time. Um, as a person who specializes in, in zooplankton dynamics, there, there haven't been a lot of sensors that have been um, developed for a study in zooplankton, but this is one of them. Shadow graph camera collects silhouette images of, uh, of, of zooplankton, um, and we use it in my lab for detecting uh, copepods, which are uh, uh, whale prey, sorry, collecting images of copepods, uh, images of gelatinous zooplankton and marine snow to study uh, particle dynamics. So here are some nice pretty pictures that my uh, master's student and uh, taxonomist took with our prototype uh, shadow graph of um, some gelatinous zooplankton, some tunicates and siphonophores, as well as um, some copepods. This is really Im an important advancement because um, net sampling, which is kind of the gold standard for, uh, for sampling zooplankton in the ocean, doesn't do a good job of preserving gelatinous zooplankton. And so there's actually very little that we know about uh, uh, gelatinous zooplankton. So we're very excited about uh, what we're going to learn from this uh, technology development project. So that's our newest project in the lab. Um, we also are looking at multi-frequency acoustic, so hydroacoustic echo sounders mounted on slocum gliders, which Rayon has also uh, been doing. So a Canadian uh, company on the West Coast um, developed the instrument that, that we're using. And I had a master's student assess the performance of a multi-frequency echo sounder for detecting um, copepods. Um, and particularly, she was looking at how well the, the echo sounder detected deep layers of these lipid-rich, high biomass um, calanoid copepods called Calanus remarchicus, which whales like to, to, to eat. And the nice thing about the gliders is that because they're a profiling platform, the, the, they bring the transducer deep down into these um, deep scattering layers of copepods uh, because these fluid filled copepods don't scatter sound very well. So the, the transducer actually has to be quite close to them to, uh, to sample these, uh, to detect these layers. Um, and so this is really exciting. What you're seeing on uh, in the graph there is one of the main results from uh, Delphine's thesis, where she, uh, what you see on the x-axis is essentially um, the acoustic uh, uh, backscatter from the glider echo sounder relative to the predicted uh, acoustic backscatter from net samples. So that's like our gold standard sampler. And what she found was that at the frequencies that we expect to detect these animals, um, the this uh, this glider mounted instrument, which is more of a low power instrument, performs about as well as a typical fisheries echo sounder. So um, so yeah, so we uh, do some technology development uh, projects around uh, sampling zooplankton, um, but we are we also do a lot of work on acoustics and, and marine mammal passive acoustic monitoring. And uh, we've been working with a large number of partners, including a uh, lab at, uh, at Dalhousie, Dave Barkley's lab, uh, and, and Romina Gehrman, who's here today, um, to uh, use uh, the uh, passive acoustic data that our gliders are detecting, um, are, are, are recording, um, to understand more about the ambient noise field. Um, in different parts of uh, Atlantic Canada. So on your left, what you see is a map of a glider deployment that we did across Laurentian Channel. So that's Anacostia Island in the north and the Gas Bay in the south. And um, in between those two dotted lines is a shipping lane. So we expected it to be a very noisy area, but this is also an area where um, there's a high risk of whales uh, getting hit by boats. And we wanted to, uh, we wanted to be able to uh, provide uh, real-time passive acoustic detections uh, to Transport Canada so that they could uh, slow ships down when endangered whales were in the area. But first we had to know, well, where, how, what's our probability of detection? What are, what's the likelihood that in this really noisy area where there are a lot of boats that we're actually going to be able to detect anything? And so we took the glider and went uh, back and forth across this uh, area. And then on the uh, right hand side, what you see is the noise level uh, distribution um, uh, from uh, uh, minus 30 kilometers, which is near Gas Bay, to plus 30, which is near Anacosti. And what we thought we would see was 
like really big increase in the middle of the shipping lanes in the middle of the graph there. But the, the noise levels aren't actually all that much higher in the shipping lanes. There's the variability is a little higher, but um, it actually the whole channel is kind of noisy. Um, and so this was very important. We weren't totally sure we were going to be able to use gliders as a dynamic management trigger. Um, but it turned out that um, we can actually detect uh, 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 the uh, large uh, baleen whales in this environment, even though it's quite a loud environment. Um, so I have a, a, a postdoctoral fellow who's working on um, a, 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 a characterizing the variability in the detections of different large whale species um, in relation to these shipping lanes. And what uh, I'm showing here is uh, detection rates of uh, blue whales under different uh, conditions. And uh, you can see the graph with the, the ship ab above it um, uh, shows the detection rates inside the lanes versus outside the lanes for two different types of calls that blue whales make. Uh, orange is one type of call and, and, and light blue is a different type of call. And what we found is that the probability of detecting those calls was about the same whether the glider was inside the lanes or it was outside the lanes. Um, and uh, the, the middle graph shows how the detection rates vary with different noise levels and the far graph shows how they vary um, at different times of, of day and night. So we didn't find a big DL uh, uh, a cycle and we found that you know, we could detect these animals even when uh, ships were, uh, ship noise was was relatively uh, high. And so we ended up uh, doing that. So the last couple of years, we've put a glider in one of these dynamic shipping zones and it's been detecting right whales. And when right whales are detected, there's a 10 knot speed limit implemented for a period of, of two weeks um, in order to reduce the likelihood of a lethal vessel strike. Uh, in that area, which is very important for that species. Um, so um, we can put all of this information together um, from, from these different uh, sensors to characterize uh, baleen whale habitat. And so I have a PhD student who's working on this in the Shadiac Valley region of the uh, Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence. So my goal for a long time, in fact, since I started working on gliders in, in 2014, was to, de to develop gliders as fully autonomous ocean ecosystem monitoring platforms. And um, with the advancement of the zooplankton sensors, we're getting there. Um, and so uh, in, this, in the Shadiac Valley, we've had gliders that carry a, a hydrophone and a fisheries a acoustic echo sounder. CTD and other uh, oceanographic uh, uh, sensors. And we're building models of whale habitat from that uh, data. Uh, what you see on the right is an example of one of the surveys we did this summer. So you can see the kind of the, um, the transect pattern that we did and where you see red dots, North Atlantic right whales were detected there. And in the inset, you can see the temperature in the water column. So we are moving between coastal and, and offshore water masses and looking at how uh, right whale uh, and their how right whales and their food are associated with those environmental conditions. So the last uh, project that I'll highlight here is um, uh, related to again to conservation um, uh, management. So uh, in Transport Canada uses our real time detections of right whales to. Uh, trigger speed limits. DFO is also using them to trigger uh, dynamic fishery uh, closures. Um, so I had a master's student working on how do we actually uh, design glider surveys in such a way that they can support very specific uh, management plans because these management plan these fishery management plans, especially the dynamic ones, are actually incredibly complicated. So what you're seeing in this sim in this uh, uh, GIF here is a real glider deployment that we did that was really designed to close uh, fisheries areas and actually did close fisheries areas. And um, and what you see when you see a red dot come up, that's where we made a glider detection. And then when you see a box turn red, there's a temporary fishery closure in that area. And um, 
when it turns gray, it becomes a season long uh, uh, closure. So in uh, in reality, there were already actually a lot of these areas were closed by the time we deployed the gliders. So that's why this says hypothetical. This is how many we would have closed if um, uh, there hadn't already been uh, some closures in, in place, but we would have made 51 closures because the right whales were really spread over the entire um, southern uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, and this was by the 2020 rules, the 2021 rules have changed. And so we are have been sort of adapting um, the way that we apply gliders as uh, dynamic management tools based on how the, the management plans have been changing. So the results here, these are examples. These are This is the first time anybody, to my knowledge, has used gliders for this purpose. Um, and so uh, these results kind of highlight that we can use gliders as a tool for uh, dynamic management and while simultaneously collecting important ecological information. So thank you for listening. I, I want to uh, acknowledge so many people, this is very, very much a collaborative effort. There are a lot of people in this room who are, who are uh, involved in uh, this, this uh, research, and uh, this would not be possible without the uh, collaboration of a lot of different uh, uh, agencies that have supported it over many, many years. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Kim. I guess we'll get started with our next panelist, um, Danny Merritt, staff engineer with Liquid Robotics, a company who manufactures the wave gliders. In his nearly 10 years with Liquid Robotics, Danny has led field missions spanning 16 countries and all major ocean, oceanic bodies of water in, in support of commercial, defense, and scientific applications of the wave glider. Danny is home based at the Liquid Robotics Hawaii Operations Facility on the Big Island of Hawaii. In his prior professional life, Danny spent nearly 10 years as an engineer and oceanographer at NOAA's Pacific Fisheries Science Center, Coral Reef Ecosystem Division, supporting coral reef research across the Western Pacific and Coral Triangle. Danny has a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from California Polytechnic State University and a master's in ocean engineering from University of Hawaii, Manoa. Over to you, Danny. No. I'll just push the down button. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everybody for, for having me here and thank you for the introduction, Adam. Uh, I, I think I kind of have a similar story to, to Kim about the uh, the wave glider um, and, and showing up here uh, back in 2013 um, with the new, the new, it was an SV2 at the time, one of our very oldest, uh, our very oldest version. And um, and got to spend the, you know, about 10 days or so here with the, it was just Adam and Richard and uh, and John, uh, uh, yeah, here with the with the team at the time. And so, to the reason, real reason that I'm here uh, or able to be here today is because of the growth of that program um, and what a good partner they've been um, in the development of the wave glider from from that SV2 uh, all the way up to the uh, a V300 four versions of wave gliders later now. So, um, yeah, thank thank you for to the whole uh, OTN and. and uh, the uh, glider crew here. So, uh, yeah, I've been uh, with Liquid Ro Liquid Robotics for almost ten years now. So I've grown up with the with the uh, SV3 version of our wave glider. Um, but perhaps just to give a little street cred to this crowd, uh, I included a picture of me back in 2010 with NOAA uh, servicing a, a BEMCO sensor. This is Kingman Reef uh, in the Lion Islands. Um, so I am familiar with uh, all the other types of work that that. Uh, that this this larger group uh, has been doing, uh, yeah. And I also did uh, my master's thesis was uh, developing a camera system, stereo video, kind of a brub, I think is the common term for them. Um, and so I, I have a little bit of fisheries background, even though I'm uh, I'm really an, an engineer. Uh, so uh, we've had quite a bit of good information about uh, what a wave glider is today. So uh, I can speed through a little bit of this. Um, but it's really a we consider consider a three part architecture. So we have a float that always stays on the surface. We have the part underwater that is we call the sub, and then those are connected by an umbilical. The umbilical provides power and communication between the two devices. Um, you can see that we can house a number of different computing power uh, batteries, 
payloads, antennas uh, up on the float. And then we have solar power uh, up there to recharge batteries. So that allows us to stay out in the water for, uh, you know, in theory, kind of infinitely. It's usually a sensor-driven thing or it's atom eluted. Biofouling uh, comes into play just like anything we put in the ocean. So the way that this works, this is the real breakthrough in, in the wave guider technology is that we were able to extract the heave of a wave and create forward motion with that. So uh, as, as was noted earlier, the, the, the sub is always out in front of the float. So it's essentially pulling it through the water. So as we go up, the, up a wave, it pulls the sub up and forward. As we go down the wave with gravity, it's going down and forward. We have a, a compass in the in what we call the thrutter. It's a thruster and a rudder combined. Uh, and that we can then, the float is always in GPS contact. So we can tell, make corrections to different waypoints and thereby steer uh, the system very uh, effectively. So let's see if I can, I hope this plays for us. So this is another thing that uh, since 20, 17, 2018, 2019, we went about uh, going out to do what we call extreme sea st state testing. Of course, everybody that wants to use robots, uh, they want to put them in these dangerous places that people don't want to be. So here's kind of some baseline uh, video from Hawaii, uh, very low sea state to kind of one meter-ish waves. Um, but you can see how the wave glider actually moves through the water. It sits very low. Um, so we get wash over, keeps the panels clean. Um, this actually helps us in uh, in very high sea states as well. So then this is the testing we did uh, out of Iceland. Uh, so uh, sea state seven, six to nine meters, the same waves. Um, and you can see how it rides here. So here we are, it, it'll actually push right through waves that crash over it. And then you can see uh, the underwater shot of this. This is a camera on a tow fish. So we're towing another body behind the, the sub. Um, and you can kind of get a good sense of how this system really works in a sea state like this, because the, uh, it, it's very active at the, at the surface. But as, as you go down to depth, uh, you're really getting that pumping action in a much quieter kind of environment there. So uh, yeah, we can put sensors in a number of different places and I'll highlight here, I have another slide on it, but uh, I'll just highlight it here. The, uh, one of our newest uh, additions is a profiling winch. So we can uh, now send devices, uh, full ethernet and comms down to 150 meters uh, on, on this uh, winch system that we have, uh, which I think is gonna be quite a game changer for a number of different applications, uh, whether it's CTD profiling, or getting down uh, to different depths for, uh, for different uh, acoustic signals or getting below thermal clients uh, for a lot of different acoustic applications there. So uh, yeah, it, it, so it's kind of the, it, we're, we're never gonna get to, you know, we're still gonna be needing other types of gliders that can go to different depths, but it, it does give us a, a lot more uh, um, applications that wave gliders can, can participate in now. So how do we interact with it? So we've got a system called the Wave Ladder Management System. Uh, this is a cloud-based, so I can go on my cell phone from the bar and uh, pilot a Wave Ladder anywhere around the world. Uh, we can do a hosted version or an enterprise version, depending on uh, the different applications um, and kind of what information you, you as a customer may want to uh, allow us to see. Uh, so this allows us for our basic command and control. Uh, we can get some data back. Uh, but then we also offer some uh, more programmatic methods for extracting data through what we call uh, the WGMS the data service. So if anybody's interested in that, I can go into more detail. But this is just a, uh, so this was a mission actually that we ran um, off the south part of the Big Island uh, on NOAA project. And each one of those little red, let me see if I can point to them, these little red dots, we call those breadcrumbs. So that's just a piece of telemetry that's coming back. Um, in this case, I think it's coming back every five minutes. So you can see WaveGlider came in, held station in a very tight circle uh, for a survey that was being done, and then was able to transit out back off. Another thing I like to highlight in this is, so this is a, 
uh, a FAD that's in there, a fish aggregating device as part of uh, things that are deployed around Hawaii. Uh, so these have, uh, this is like a, the, the, an exclusion zone that we can put on a map uh, so that it would highlight if a wave ladder went in there, it would alarm and it would be saying that, you know, you might get entangled in that FAD if it's there. But what I like to show here is that the size of the watch circle required for that FAD versus the kind of the size of uh, that we can we can hold uh, for, for with a wave glider uh, in any depth of water. And so if you're doing like acoustic communications to different devices like they are uh, here to offload the, the BM4s, we can be very, very effective because we can park right over the top of that node uh, and, and have a direct path to it. Uh, again, a little bit more information on the winch. Uh, happy to go over this with anybody that's interested. Um, so here's a little slide on you now what do we do? So what do you do with the wave glider? And I think it's really, Adam alluded to it, uh, it's really up to your imagination. It's really, it's a boat at the end of the day um, that you can put any sensor that you want. So it's, we're going to be power limited and size limited, but other than that, it's really what your imagination can bring to the table. Uh, this is a little bit about the company. I think I'm going to skip through this. I'd rather have a little bit more time for conversation. Uh, so over the Wave Riders is a little over 15 years old as a company uh, now, and we've really have been everywhere in the world with Wave Riders um, in some very challenging places, uh, uh, very high latitude locations. So um, I've probably been to 30% or 50% of these places. So lots of stories to tell about them. Uh, and then I'll just end with one one uh, other survey. So I, I think a lot of you are familiar with uh, Eric Ryer's work. So he's doing uh, a project off of Cape Canaveral. Um, so this is a, they're not at quite as advanced as, as the team up here is uh, in the way they're using it. But they're, so this is a series of receivers that they have out there and they're using the wave glider to kind of augment what they're doing and getting uh, looking at some of the more mig highly migratory species that are that are outside of this region, uh, and then kind of doing some spillover effect uh, outside of the, the the main area that they're surveying, uh, and they've had some great success there. They're also kind of getting into the world of uh, soundscape monitoring um, and a lot of just passive acoustic work with their fish species. So some interesting work coming out of there as well. Uh, that's that's really complementary um, to to what is going on here. Uh, and then the other piece that I've noted uh, in, in the discussions this week is, uh, is that idea of complementary data. And so the nice, one of the nice things about a platform like this is that it can host uh, all the meteorological and oceanographic information on the same platform that you're going out and getting uh, your, your uh, tag data from. And so it all is nicely consolidated. It gives you the context of what's happening uh, while you're out there. And I think with that, I'll, I'll leave it. My other slides are have already been covered. So uh, I think that's all I've got today. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Our last panelist is uh, Jean Quirion, uh, Research and Development uh, Director with Innovacy. Jean heads up the R&D team that develops and oversees next generation acoustic telemetry tags, receivers, and fish tracking technology. Jean has over 20 years of experience in the tech sector, working with R&D teams to develop value through technology innovations. Jean's background spans electronics, engineering, digital signal processing, machine learning and AI, and software development. Over to you. Thank you very much, Adam. There we go. All right, so hello everybody. I'm super excited to be here with you today to tell you a little bit about some exciting things we've been working on at Novacy, um, specifically our new acoustic telemetry receiver that's designed specifically for being deployed on moving things like gliders, for example. So just a little bit about Innovacy. I think uh, most of this audience probably have an idea of what we do. I think most of you or many of you might have um, been at our workshop uh, on Monday uh, and some of our tour, but uh, we're formerly known as Vemco. 
Um, and uh, we make acoustic telemetry fish tracking equipment uh, cons consisting of tags uh, for fish, receivers. Um, generally, uh, we try to provide the kind of the turnkey fish tracking uh, system for underwater. So at Inova C, we, we, we really view uh, gliders as a way to track beyond our traditional fixed uh, array. So um, in areas of the ocean where you can't uh, populate enough receivers. Um, so for that reason, in recent years, um, we've set out to make a new kind of receiver technology that is designed specifically for moving. It's, it's really designed for being deployed on things that are moving like gliders, like AUVs or other vessels of opportunity in the ocean. So this uh, new receiver was designed uh, in very close collaboration with OTN, in fact, uh, and the CAS group in New Brunswick. So we've received a lot of feedback from these groups um, that went into the design of this receiver. Um, it was designed as part of our Ocean Aware project, um, which is sponsored by Canada's Ocean Supercluster. Um, it is a cabled receiver. Um, so as such, um, you can connect this cable uh, to an onboard computer, for example, on your glider, and you'll get real-time fish detections through it, in addition to the fact that it stores these detections. But, um, you know, it really looks different than anything we've ever made. Um, in particular, it has this kind of really long nose that you see there that's very noticeable, um, very different from if you're used to working with our VR2 receivers, for example, it looks different. Uh, the reason for that uh, long nose is inside the structure, um, we, we house a completely new hydrophone design um, that's very, very uh, different and much more sophisticated than anything we've ever made. Um, and in particular, this hydrophone design has much better um, flow noise immunity. So hydroacoustic flow noise is really noise that you get from water flowing over your hydrophone. And this is really important when you're moving, you wanna minimize that noise as much as possible. Um, in addition to that, um, so this new receiver, uh, this new hydrophone uh, head, if you will, in addition to some new digital signal processing that we do inside the receiver, um, allows this receiver to beam form. So it can create these very powerful, very sharp listening beams that we can steer at whatever angle we want uh, using signal processing. And the reason this is really important, especially when moving, is that uh, we can selectively uh, have the receiver listen away from sources of noise and towards the signals of interest like fish tags, for example. So let me show you an example of that. So this is a um, liquid robotics wave glider subunit. Um, and, uh, on this particular unit, uh, we did we actually designed uh, a custom attachment that holds uh, our mobile receiver, which you can see here, and it also holds um, a VR2C Mini and a v oops and a VMT. And actually, um, fun fact: the reason we designed this custom attachment was to kind of test these three receivers uh, side by side on an OTN uh, liquid robotics uh, wave glider. Uh, but unfortunately it got caught in Hurricane Fiona and we completely lost uh, this, uh, this subunit, um, but we'll have to try again some other day. Um, but anyhow, so this, uh, this wave glider, as it goes about its mission in the ocean, um, you know, it moves a lot and the subunit goes up and down. And as um, Danny mentioned, uh, it has these wings that are moving around to propel the unit forward and all that creates a lot of noise uh, mechanical noise um, that translates into acoustic noise and all that noise, you know, impact the ability of these receivers to hear what they're really there to hear, which is fish tags. And so our new mobile receiver, uh, again, because it can beam form, it has this ability to really selectively steer its listening in different direction than this noise and actually focus on the tag fish. So it works a lot better. So how well does it work? Um, well, again, we were attempting to test that with OTN uh, on the wave glider, but didn't get any results from that. But we do have results from different field trials that we've done that I can show you and kind of give you a glimpse of, of what it can do. So we've tested um, this new receiver 
um, with the Shark Lab at the California State University, Long Beach in California recently this fall. Um, and we basically tested side by side uh, one of our new mobile receiver, which you can see here uh, with a VR2TX on their ocean server, Iver 3 AUV. And again, just quickly, I'll show you a, a little bit of the results that we've obtained, but it looks very promising. Um, so this is um, an example of the AUV mission path um, as it's moving towards sort of the center of these circles here where we dropped a couple tags underwater. Um, and the dots on the mission path represents um, basically detections that these receivers have made. So you can clearly see here that our mobile receiver um, has you know, gotten a lot more detections than our VR2TX. Uh, lastly, uh, just this, this other uh, graph here kind of summarizes a whole, uh, whole bunch of data we collected during this trial um, and shows you basically the probability of detection um, as a function of range for both of these receivers. Uh, the mobile receiver is in dark blue and the VR2TX is in light blue. So you can clearly see the superior uh, sort of range performance of this new receiver compared to our traditional kind of receiver technology. And again, this is because we've designed this new receiver with uh, you know, mobile applications in mind, if you will. So that's really it for me. Um, it's been really exciting at Innova C to work on this new tech. Um, it's still in R&D. This is not a product that's available. So we're still working on it. It's sort of in its beta stage, but we're very interested in um, you know, hearing from you if you have an application where, where we can partner and, and further test this new technology. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'll welcome the panelists to, to have a seat. Thank you all for your wonderful presentations. Now we'll get into our um, question period. So um, I guess to get things, we'll just jump right into it to get things started off. Uh, I guess the question is, what is on the cutting edge of research and development in the glider world right now? Um, uh, do I have any takers to start this off? I can, I can kick it off. Sure, Danny. Because there was something I was gonna bring up anyway in the in my discussion that I didn't, um, I think so. Uh, I think glider to glider communications is going to really uh, make a huge leap in in the way that we're doing things. So if we can, if the robots can really take over the world here, then uh, and start talking to each other instead of having us com command them, uh, I think that will uh, will really leapfrog uh, a lot of the things that that uh, we're doing today and a lot of the the work that I saw. I'm not I mean, imagine a uh, 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 a slocum glider that doesn't have to come to the surface; it can just be redirected underwater um, with commands from a wave glider that's parked over the top of it, um, or that can get that data off um, while at depth. Um, and there are people that are that are already working on that. You know, and the Embaris of the world, I think, have uh, have already demonstrated that kind of technology. Cool. Thanks. Anybody else? Well, um, I have been. Uh really excited about the uh, improvements in uh, low power sensors for the gliders. And I think that's just that's just getting better and better. Um, a lot of uh, oceanographic uh, properties are uh, they, they require quite complex sensors, uh, you know, to measure them. And so that uh, tends to lead to high powers high power consumption, but a lot of companies have taken it on themselves to completely redesign their, you know, their sensors to, to, to work on low power systems. And as a researcher, I'm always like, that's the first question that I ask when I am uh, looking at uh, sensor suites is what's the power consumption? Because 
the, you know, that long endurance is, uh, you know, that the platforms are capable of is, uh, is uh, a, a very important for um, studying uh, processes and, and scales that, that we can't necessarily study very well with, with ships, uh, you know, shorter term ship deployments. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's been a, a real revolution in that direction and, and we're seeing more and more of it in, in the biological oceanographic community, that's for sure. Yeah, certainly. Um, that's for sure, especially with these uh, slogan gliders with fixed battery you know, as soon as the glider goes in the water, it's got a drop dead date because it's going to run out of battery. And, you know, we're talking about uh, LED light bulbs, like one that you'd have in your house. That's a really high powered instrument for uh, an autonomous platform. Um, you know, the wave glider can handle a little more battery with its uh, solar panels as long as there's sun. But yeah, it's still that's that's one um, really important aspect to this. Yeah, uh, the, the microphone. So I guess along those lines, um, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I'm more of a sensor engineer than a glider engineer, but okay. I can I can talk a little bit about on the sensor side, you know, certainly what we're doing at Inovacy, um, you know, on the on the telemetry side, you know, our R and D focus is really on how can we how can we deliver more detections, higher quality detections. Um, and as real time as possible, right? That's kind of, and all the while, while consuming as little power as possible. So that's, you know, back to your, your point. Um, and so our, you know, the receiver I talked about earlier is an example of that, where um, we're playing some tricks, you know, that makes it work better in a mobile environment that just will probably give you more detections than before. Um, and, and, so I'm not a glider engineer, but I would I would assume that in the glider world, there's a desire of putting you know more sensors um, on one one vehicle, and therefore that would that would mean you know more more power somehow, bigger batteries, more, or or more computational efficiency that uses less power to to make better use, I guess, of the power available. Yeah, certainly. Thanks. Um, so I guess the, the use of remote platforms like gliders have led to challenging data sets to analyze, uh, lots of different types of data, whether it be collected from biological, chemical, or physical sensors are often being measured on the same platform. Uh, can you touch a little bit about this in your, in your talk? Um, spatial and temporal scales also need to be thought of because the gliders are, you know, they're moving and, you know, in some cases with depth and with time and with position all at the same time. So the data sets get really complex really quick. Um, and it's, it's challenging for, for newcomers and students or, and even senior researchers. It's, it's a tricky problem to, to tackle. Um, and I guess the question is, do you have any ideas of how gliders or glider data could be made more accessible for, for researchers that either want to get into it or, or, you know, even experienced researchers that, that just need some new ideas? Um, Kim, can we start off with, with you for this one? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is an excellent question. Um, be, uh, and it, it's something that I think about a lot. Um, bringing uh, new graduate students into the the glider world, um, and um, I, I don't I don't I don't know that I have a ma any magic strategies because I don't know that I've done really well with it yet. But um, one approach that I've uh, uh, taken with new students is give them one sensor to work on, and and. Uh, and, and to do short term and to give a, a new project to somebody that's got a short term deployment associated with it and some sort of like shipboard validation data. So instead of getting them to, to work on, you know, uh, four, five, six months worth of data and, and trying to figure that out, kind of uh, uh, making the problem a little bit smaller scale and in, 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 uh, making it a little bit more tractable in, in that way. But I, I think this is really important because the sea otter glider data is freely uh, available. It's it's shared. It's it's open data, and um, I've had really relatively few uh, uh, people asked to use it 
the data that we've been collecting over the years and we'd like to uh, get more usage out of that data. Um, and uh, they're, they're, some of the sensors are a little bit complicated, but some of them are not. <laughs> and uh, another way that, that, that researchers can help make that data a little more accessible is like one of the things that we do is we uh, analyze the uh, hydrophone data in real time, right? So, uh, and then we have uh, uh, whale detections, you know, there's a right whale here, there's a, a, a blue whale here, and then making that those the data products uh, a little available to to newer people to work with as well. So there's there's a couple of ideas in there, but it is a difficult problem. Anyone else? Yeah, um, I mean this isn't just uh, an issue for you know gliders and data like that. There's all kinds of new sophisticated instruments that are producing a lot a lot of data. Some of the you know buoys that we have out, and my students can talk about it. I mean. It's a lot of data, but you're right. The spatial part of it makes it more difficult. I guess the key is stuff like Ocean Tracking Network or RAYOM, where you have the technicians and the expertise to help the student get through some of that stuff and, and make sure that they're not spending all their time just trying to run the project itself and getting to the data. Um, but it is, and, and, and I think we need to think about this at an undergraduate level or, or, or even at a graduate level as providing opportunities for students to get exposure to this kind of data and how you deal with it, right? Um, it, is, it is a challenge across, you know, all, all areas and, and not just oceanography or limnology, right? I mean, um, we collect a lot of data now, so it, it is an issue, yeah. Thanks. I'll just add on the on the glider and sensor side. I think it's uh, it's really imperative that that we kind of have standards that we're um, of how we're both like parsing data out and how we're delivering it to shore um, to make it easier for people to then digest ingest that into their own world. So uh, I think that there's a part that that we play on the technical side to provide that, and then I would say um, you know. This is John's job on the on the back end, right? <laughs> uh, but also, like the in the U.S. Uh, world, it's the, I think that's uh, the oozes play a big part in uh, in kind of creating those standards and then housing that data and, and making it available for people. Uh, metadata standards, yeah, that's uh, near and dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, I guess uh, change, turning the the wheel a little bit here and thinking about the the UN decade for ocean science uh, for sustainable development, um, I guess it's been a theme. Maybe not uh, has been talked about all that much in this symposium much, but I think it's an important theme to touch on um, generally. So, in any of your experiences, uh, how can gliders and associated technologies? help meet some of the challenges to the ocean decade? <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> I can start. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think, I think if you look at the challenges that are in the scope of the UN decade of ocean, um, a lot of them, gliders are in line with a lot of them, like ex expanding the you know, ocean observation system, for example. I mean, that's glider, perhaps having more of them would, would, would be better. Um, and the data that they can provide, um, you know, can, can, again, I think it's in line with a lot of the challenges in you know, helping humanity um, get more you know, in, in tune with sort of the value of the ocean and understand the ocean better and that, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, so uh, gliders are tools. Uh, they're tools that are being used to support management, uh, you know, ocean management, uh, freshwater management uh, objectives for uh, uh, for threatened species, for exploited species. So certainly there's a strong linkage there with the, the objectives of the UN uh, ocean decade. Um, and uh, for me, I, one of the uh, challenges that I, that I face working with marine mammals in uh, especially large whales that are very highly migratory is uh, 
that their uh, distribution is so variable over such large uh, uh, space-time uh, domains. And I can never get enough ship time. <laughs> I can never ever get enough ship time to get a handle on their distribution, real handle on their distribution. And so the, the the gliders are perfect. They're you know they're extensions of uh, you know our eyes on the water, uh, and they can stay out for for much longer uh, uh, periods of time. And they've just been absolutely instrumental in uh, filling in those those uh, gaps that we have in uh, the, the 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 shipborne data as well as as, as aerial surveillance uh, data for for marine mammals and I would imagine this similar things can be said for for fish so it's a big ocean out there I say that a lot <laughs> to my lab it's it, in and to people who are wondering where where right whales are and, and why we can't seem to find them. It's a huge amount of ocean and we really undersample it. Uh, and, and particularly in the in the pelagic ecosystem, it even with all the technologies that we have, it is undersampled. And so gliders are 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 very instrumental in in filling those gaps. Yeah. Yes, Aaron. Yeah, actually, I mean both spatially and temporally. I mean, there's so much that we don't know and things are changing so quickly right now. And I, I think of I think of Lake Erie and what goes on for the harmful algal blooms. So these harmful algal blooms can switch to producing toxic chemicals, microcystins, and there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, Toledo in 2013 or 14, I always get that date wrong, had to shut down their water supply for a city of over half a million for almost a week um, because of microcystins, right? And we still don't really understand what triggers those those microcystin uh, blue green algae to switch from being you know not producing a toxic chemical to producing a toxic chemical, despite how important that is. So I think when you think about meeting these these needs for the ocean, you know, uh, um, uh, objectives and stuff, is we almost have to have gliders and we almost have to have buoys and instruments that are collecting continuous data because the amount of variability out in the environment is incredible. Um, again, I, I think of some of the phosphorus work that my late colleague Joe Crossman was collecting um, on soluble reactive phosphorus and, and the level differences between times when you collect during the day and at night can be two orders of magnitude. So if you're going out in the middle of the afternoon and collecting a grab sample, you are missing all the variability and, and variability is what the world's becoming. So we can, I don't think, meet some of these objectives without this technology. We need this technology. Thanks a lot. Um, I guess we are running low on time here. So I think uh, we're going to, I'm going to pass it off to Evie. Um, and uh, oh, we can, we've got time for some questions. Okay, great. Um, my apologies. I guess we've got time for questions from the audiences. Uh, if there's any, we've got one over here. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your excellent presentations. Um, I'm from Peru. And so as you're mentioning all this work, just so many ideas come to mind of how this could be applicable in my country. And you're mentioning the decade, for example. And, and I think that um, as the world transitions into more technology, we're also talking more about access, as you mentioned, but also in terms of access, um, to, for example, countries or communities that don't typically have access to these type of technologies that don't have the resources. And we're also talking more about equity and, and how we can get these to other places. So I want to tap on, um, on your experience, perhaps on uh, and ideas of how we can take some of these amazing projects and initiatives and technology and make sure that countries such as mine, um, that I, I don't see very much um, represented necessarily here, uh, can access these opportunities as well. Yeah, it can be pretty expensive to run a glider, especially when you're trying to offload a lot of data, um, your satellite costs can get quite extreme. So that 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 is a challenge. And I, I think it also comes back to some of the discussion of training and be able to use these things. So the, again, I 
you know, ocean tracking network was a, was a brilliant idea, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, it's still a brilliant idea. These larger groups, you know, coming together to fund these things. Um, but I think like a lot of, a lot of things going on in the world right now, we need to be looking to our less fortunate countries that maybe can't afford this and making that part of, of what we do. And I know NSERC has, has moved towards uh, funding opportunities to work in other countries, uh, seed money to get those relationships going. And then if you can find some more money, uh, more money to do that. And I think that's really important because we're all in this together, particularly at the ocean level, right? Because if, if we're understanding around Canada and the United States, there's still lots of important things that go other way. So I, I think it's a really important thing to consider. And, and again, the training issue um, and, and providing the training issues is, is really important part of that as well. I, I think I'd flip the, 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 a little bit of a pretext there also though, the gliders are actually less expensive than our traditional methods, which is a large reason why we're going in that world. And so it's not necessarily a matter of the gliders being so expensive that our countries can't, you know, they, we need to do that work everywhere. Um, and so those that we need to direct the money in the right way uh, as much as we need to. I, I just don't want it to be coming out out of this thinking that the the gliders are more expensive than other ways of doing the data collect. So yeah, sorry that that's a really good point. But yeah, it, but they're not completely free, and there's a lot of ups ups and costs. But you're right for sure. I mean, the difference between running a shipboard and even in the Great Lakes can be like eight thousand dollars a day versus you know three hundred dollars of satellite time. So great point. That's important to, to mention. And, and I'll add that the there are actually wave gliders in Peru, so we can talk. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Yep. Fair enough. So a couple of things. There's uh, a couple of things that I like about uh, the way that OTN uh, runs the glider program, and I, I can't even call it an OTN glider program anywhere. It's a OTN slash me par slash 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 because so many people support it. It's a networked resource. I don't own any, like my lab doesn't own any gliders. We don't buy gliders. We contribute everything to a program that is then, that then other researchers uh, can subscribe to. Um, and that that is not the whole answer, but that is a helpful attribute uh, for uh, facilitating uh, international uh, uh, use of these 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 programs. And the other thing that's nice about the gliders uh, relative to ships, of course, is how portable they are. Uh, we put uh, we put a glider technician and a, a, a glider on a plane and a truck, and they can go into different parts of the country and 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 be deployed there so the portability is another nice uh, uh characteristic of of gliders that that makes them i think gets us at least part of the way there uh compared to more conventional methods thanks any other questions Hi, uh, Liz from Acadia University here. Um, so we use some gliders to do some mobile tracking of halibut, but as a lot of people may know, last time we tried that a uh, shark attacked the glider and damaged the thrutter. So my question is how often are you seeing these animal interactions with your gliders and is there any kind of design <laughs> or development to prevent that or strengthen the gliders? Well, I, I guess it, it might be regionally, uh, there might be some regional context there. Um, to date, uh, we've, we've got wave gliders bitten by sharks twice, and we've actually had teeth lodged in there. So we know that that was in fact a shark. Uh, but maybe Danny or some other people have uh, uh, more, more context in, in more southern regions. Yeah, we, I mean, in our testing in Hawaii, we, we do see it. Uh, I don't think that we have gotten to the point where we consider it to be the primary issue. Um, I was just telling Adam earlier, it's actually the, the fishermen in our area are very familiar with wave gliders and they do tend to hold uh, mahi and, and some other uh, fish that, that you know are of interest. And so we get way more hooks in our umbilicals than we do shark bites or barracudas attacking them. So uh, you know, I, I don't know that we particularly have a, a mitigation in mind for that right now but uh if it if it continues to become a problem i mean that's how we tend to address things is, is uh by priority levels um so 
if that's a showstopper for a particular place, uh, then we would definitely go and, and try and address it. I guess, oh, you know, Vandergoot talks about the dangerous walleye. Um, we don't, <laughs> We don't have shark uh, issues in the Great Lakes, but um, we do have commercial fishing, particularly in Lake Erie. It's the second largest commercial fishery in the world. It's worth almost half a billion dollars, actually. But um, that's an issue that we sometimes run into. And some of the areas that we want to work have intensive fishing pressure. So that's a good thought about uh, being concerned about fishing nets and stuff like that as well. So I don't know if you guys have, have you run into that in, in marine environments much? For sure. Yeah. It's a, so we do, uh, that's part of our risk assessment on any mission. And so we have, to, because we're at the surface, we're interacting at the level of, of the fishing vessels themselves. Um, so it's definitely, you know, we take a lot of, uh, local knowledge, uh, into, into account about where fishermen are going to be, uh, during, you know, we used to operate a lot out of Monterey Bay when, uh, we're testing. And so there'd be the crab season that we would have to contend with. Um, so those are all what about, what about, sorry, what about boaters? Like, is it a problem that they ever mess with the with the wave flat on the surface? So I think everybody in the in this room's probably been on a boat. Uh, and if you see something floating in the water, what's the first thing that you do? <laughs> so uh, yeah, it is an issue, but uh, again, part of the risk assessment is to um, is to understand the environment that you're putting it into and how uh, likely that is. We put signage on on wave gliders, for example, to try and keep people from, to let them know that it's under control and you don't need to pull it out and help us out. Uh, but yes, it, uh, it, the large majority of our deployments are not around, you know, they tend to be farther offshore um, where the, the fishermen aren't. And we can, we can pick up AIS signals and we can auto avoid um, large ships that are broadcasting that. And so it hasn't, really been an issue but for sure if somebody sees your wave guider out there they're going to go and look at it at the minimum thanks uh do we have time for another question yeah any any more questions oh hi yeah thanks so much um my name is Rafid. i'm from indonesia i have a question for kim um i guess that uh, sorry it's might sound like a stupid questions, but um, you study the right whales, but I'm just wondering like what's the significance of the species? So you, you, you've done this research a lot and then also you utilize a lot of resources for studying its movement. Uh, so I'm just wondering like why the species is special or like why is it receive a lot of, you know, research attention on that? Thank you. That is absolutely not a stupid question at all thank you for asking it <laughs> because i should have said that in my talk so <laughs> no north atlantic right whales are uh one of the most endangered uh large whales in the world there's only 320 of them left and their main sources of mortality are entanglement in fishing gear and uh, ship strikes. And so uh, they are, and their population is declining. So they receive a lot of uh, attention because uh, they are at a critical sort of uh, 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 stage and, and they need a lot of help <laughs> to, uh, to prevent, uh, to reduce the risk and, and, and prevent them from, from further harm. So they receive a lot of attention in uh, along the eastern seaboard of the U.S. as well as in Atlantic Canada for that reason. Yeah. Question from online. Sure. Everyone can hear it. So from uh, one of the virtual participants. They're wondering if anyone can speak to Slocum glider performance under ice cover. Good question. Um, I do not fly under ice, so I can't. Uh, I can't respond. Well, maybe. To maybe maybe one of these. Oh, Clara can. Clara's <laughs> here. Thank goodness. She needs a mic. There you go. So I'm Clara Halbert from uh, Teledyne Web Research, and I've been working with gliders for almost 20 years. So um, we 
have had gliders go under ice unexpectedly. We have some people that are beginning to work with them under ice. We can telemeter to gliders using sound sources and do it that way. Um, it's quite expensive. Um, and there are new research techniques being used now. So um, we do a lot of ice work and we have a lot of ice behavior. So that's something we spend a lot of time on because who wants to go under ice? You want the <laughs> robot there. So that's the answer. Yeah, thanks, Clara. I, I mean, as far as we're concerned, we I think Jude mentioned we look at ice maps and, and actively avoid it. Um, hopefully we'll go under ice in the future because it's it's really cool and there's not much research being done there. But at the moment, we yeah, we actively avoid it um, because, you know, if, if something goes wrong, the default behavior of the glider is to get to the surface. And if it does that under your ice, you don't get it until the ice melts. So uh, it's a big risk. I'll say that's a great application for for the acoustic communications between devices, too, so that you can be monitoring uh, where the where the under ice system is at all times with with some other platform, whether it's a manned ship or an uncrewed system. So, great. Were there any more questions online? Last chance for the crowd. All right. I guess we'll call it at that. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. You made excellent presentations, and uh, thanks for giving us your time. Thank you, Adam. Thank you.